really, really hard, and they execute the system, and that's what it's all about. Yes, sir. Trust. Big trust. Big trust. Big trust. trust. Hey, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> right on cue. Hey, right on cue. Hey, I, let me pull We are back on the Jumbo Sets podcast, presented as always by Jimmy's Famous Seafood, as well as our guys over at Black Eyed. Susan Spice is now featured on season 24 of Hot Ones on the first We Feast YouTube page. They got the coveted seven spot, one before the bomb. So tune in every week to watch the rich and famous suffer. I've been following them along a little bit. Seb has been sending me them. They're, they're very fun. As always, love hot ones. Big Sean Evans guy. Head on over to blackeyedspices.com to get some dry rub and hot sauces for all your Orioles watching and summertime grilling, smoking, and partying needs. Man, is this just the time of year to do that or what? Weather, you know, a little touch and go here in, uh, in Charm City in the uh, mid-Atlantic area here over Memorial Day weekend. Of course, it comes around today. Beautiful, perfect day out. So get ready to uh, get those grills fired up and uh, get your Black Eyed Susan Spices to help with all those needs. Like I said, that is BlackEyedSpices.com. Use the code EXIT52 at checkout for 10% off. Products also found in participating Baltimore and D.C. area ACE hardware locations. Black Eyed Susan Spices killing the game. My name is Jake Luke. I'm joined by Spencer Nathaniel Schultz. Gentle Spen Crank Shizzy. How are we doing tonight, my friend? Doing well. Did not go down the ocean for the first time probably eight years or so. It was hot and sunny in Baltimore, so that's what you guys get. It's never sunny in Ocean City anymore, so I uh, got the dealer to bust on that one. It feels like a little bit was, it was all right. It was a uh, Friday. Was a little. It was a little touch and go. It was there. There was some overcast situation going on, but I got around to golf and didn't get wet at all. Saturday was great. It was fine. Had a good beach day. Then Sunday was fine as well. It was just it was this weird kind of fog hanging over just the city itself. It it didn't really hit the rest of the peninsula, but it was just uh, the city itself. But yeah, good good overall weekend. How about how was yours? Good. Got some pool time in. It was like 80, 85, up high eighties here. And I don't know, just didn't have to pay to stay somewhere. So it felt like I kind of have played with house money a little bit for my second, I guess, uh, gambling table reference of the last sixty seconds, but. Yeah, got plenty of drinks, plenty of good food, and didn't really feel any regrets about it because I didn't pay $400 a night to go stay somewhere. So that was nice. Great weekend. Got a round of golf in, played University of Maryland for probably like the maybe like the sixth or seventh time and played one tee box back from where I usually do in preparation of a little Ryder Cup golf trip I have coming up, Ryder Cup style, and was able to break 100 there for the first time, which was funny because I was keeping my score on the grit and I thought if you're if you're on the grant, some like I don't know, I mess it up sometimes and it'll enter that whole score as par and factor it into your score already. So then like if you go up, it'll be like, oh, OK, there's another two strokes. So I thought I needed to double or less or I thought I needed to double basically to break 100 for the first time. I play there a lot, like I said. So I was like, fuck, I really want to break 100 here. And it was 18, and I clicked on something on the Grimp by accident, and it said average score on 18 was a 6.98 for me. I just melt on the 18th hole there for whatever reason. It's not a particularly hard hole. It's pretty straight. It's decently long, not crazy long. It's not you know narrow. It's not tight. A little, little tiny bit uphill, just kind of cascading back up to the clubhouse there. And lo and behold, I melted. I tripled. I got my seven. And then I realized it was actually for 97, not for 100. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. That's that's nice because I was kind of mad and then wasn't mad anymore. So that was, that was found the money moment. when you're mm -hmm. uh, you think you're doing worse than you are. I always love that feeling. Exactly. So nice weekend here. Orioles got their their stride on, which was fun to watch. I uh, had a, had a lot of fun with the the White Sox series, and then watching them go to town yesterday was a lot of fun from the course too. So pretty cool weekend this weekend. Nothing too crazy, but had a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to hear it. Here to talk some Ravens, of course, as always, a little bit scant on the news, but there are some things to discuss. First up uh, being that the Ravens made a couple signings. They signed, uh, D well, this was after they got rid of uh, defensive tackle Bravion Roy. Uh, they signed defensive tackles Deidre Sanat, who's from the Falcons, uh, six foot one, 305 pounds. He was a third round pick by the Falcons in 2018, spending three seasons in Atlanta before being released. 
signed with the Buccaneers in 2022, where he was on the practice squad and active roster for two seasons. In 37 career games, Sanat has 52 tackles, one sack, and one fumble recovery. They also signed Josh Tupu from the Bengals previously uh, in the AFC North there, six foot three, 340 pounds. Uh, been with Cincy uh, since 2017 after going undrafted. He has played in every season since. Uh, besides 2020 when he opted out for the pandemic with 23 starts in 65 games, 86 tackles, six quarterback hits, two sacks, and one forced fumble. These signings doing anything for you? Yeah, it just shows that they wanted more more guys in camp in the interior defensive line and might want to take it easy on some guys like Michael Pierce, who they did rework a contract with and has had some some injury history and some trouble with COVID and things like that. So I don't know. Between those two, I wouldn't be surprised to see one make the roster. Uh, they also did get rid of Bravey and Roy, who was someone I did really like coming out. And so some corresponding moves there. Get some more big boys on the inside, see what they can do to juice things up. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into it, but you never know. Maybe somebody doesn't feel so great or has a light medical issue that we're unaware of at this point. So I had a couple somewhat experienced players there. Uh, they do get the exception because David Ajabo is an international player, which is funny. And so they actually have 91 guys including David Ajabo there. So some, some some beef up front for Baltimore. Yeah, they strike you as camp bodies a little bit, but sometimes these camp bodies, they have a way of catching on with the Ravens. I'm sure it happens with a lot of teams, but definitely they seem to have an eye for these types of guys. And I mean, even going back to last season, I'm not expecting like even a Kyle Van Noy or some of those other guys type of impact, but I don't know. The the more the more bodies you can get in there, the more names. And Deidre Sanat was a little bit of a name in that draft. I remember when he went to the Falcons, people liked that pick a lot. Didn't work out well for him. And then this Tupo guy had better stats than I was expecting. So, you know, just, uh, just kind of a little bit of churn on the back end of the roster there, but a couple names to keep an eye on. Uh, also in news, uh, David Blackburn, who had been with the Ravens. It's a name that I wasn't super familiar with. I, I had known it because he had been there forever. Uh, he's been with the Ravens and scouting and personnel since 2007. One of these kind of guys that worked his way up the ladder uh, over the last, you know, almost 20 years at this point. Uh, and he was, uh, you know, within a high level in the Ravens front office. He was hired over by the commanders who had, I think, taken a look at a couple Ravens guys, maybe like Nick Mateo had interviewed there or something, but he is named Director of Player Personnel for the Commanders. This is your favorite team, the Commanders. How are you feeling about this move? Commanders getting personnel and decision makers from smart organizations, the 49ers and Peters there, and poaching from the Ravens. So hopefully Josh Harris able to turn them around. Some uh, some subtle R-word Hints being dropped there for them to integrate that back in a little bit, which is just a big brainworm Twitter category to ever touch on. But, uh, you know, I know a lot of people are excited about the possibility of maybe incorporating a little bit more of the team's history in ways and not just severing ties while keeping the colors the same and everything else the same from it. And it, it was weird. It's been a weird saga. And with Dan Snyder removed, I think we're going to see them make some more sound brand and business and football decisions ultimately. So I think this is kind of the first full go. This is going to be the first full year of Snyder out and a clean break. So I'm curious to see. They have a new quarterback. They have a new front office. They have a mobile quarterback. They bring in Cliff Kingsbury. So you can probably imagine what their offense is going to look like and some categories and, and some usage. So yeah, I think the commanders have a fun little thing going on down there. And, you know, they got tons of talent. They have a lot of talent. If they can shore up the defensive side of the football, Dan Quinn, I mean, Jack Del Rio, God bless his heart. He, he did some nice things in Baltimore, but guy was just the definition of an old dog that didn't want to learn a new trick. He was the classic hardo. You're going to play defense my way. This is my system. I'm going to make you play into my system, not bending his talent to, you know, bending his scheme to fit his talent at all and being malleable in that direction. And he sucked. I think he was probably really the worst defensive coordinator, especially for someone that wasn't like a head coach like Brand Staley in the NFL the last couple of years. And, you know, had a good thing going. I think three years ago they made the playoffs had a strong defense. And then uh, just what he did in the secondary and back end just made a system that was really difficult for players. It wasn't modern enough to be able to adapt. And part of that does go with Ron Rivera, who, of course, is a defensive, you know, leaning guy as well. But uh, I think the decision to hang on to Del Rio so long, Rivera is one story, but Del Rio specifically – I think really crippled them and, and prevented that defense from getting them to a spot that they should have been able to get to. So uh, going from, you know, that situation and the toxicity of Dan Snyder into Adam Peters and Dan Quinn, who's been there and done that a good bit and having some more stability and bringing in a new quarterback, hard to, hard to not feel. I mean, I know that a lot of the, the commanders, the R words fans are all dead inside 
but hard not to feel, you know, a speckle of optimism that it's a little different kind of, you know, uh, Brian goes crazy when you say this about comparing Dan Snyder to uh, the Angelos and Peter Angelos. I, I've always said that my entire life. I kind of shut up and Brian was like, that's not, I was like, oh, okay. They're I, right up the well, road and they're kind of similar. I like Peter Angelos was a, a good guy. Like anyone actually, it's interesting. Like uh, the no laying up the trap draw. They do like these uh, owners uh, deep dives on, on the trap draw. And um, they did like Angelos and Rubenstein on their most recent one. And if you go back and listen to that, like you'd be shocked to hear Angelos actually, I mean, especially for younger people that don't know, like Angelos really was on the right side of history with a lot of things uh, on a personal level as a baseball owner. You know, he definitely made his questionable decisions, but I also maintain that he really wanted to win. Like he would pay guys. He would go out of his way to pay guys. Oftentimes the wrong move, Chris Davis, really his last worst. Ubaldo Jimenez. Yeah. Jimenez. I mean, like somebody like he, he was involved. He wanted to win. He was kind of, it was almost Jerry Jones esque, and he wasn't on the same swaggering and, you know, kind of, uh, media level that the Cowboys are, but uh, Jerry Jones really does care and like want to win and does invest his money. It's just in the wrong direction a lot of the time. And I think, you know, Dan Snyder, he, I, I don't know what he was trying to do, especially in the later years there. Like he, he was a guy who, you know, he did, he did go out and sign. Who's that big defensive tackle, Albert, whatever Hainsworth, yeah. you know? Like it, yeah. Like he definitely had some of those, but even in these recent years, he didn't really spend a ton, definitely didn't spend a ton on amenities didn't really seem to want to win. He had all that shit going on with the toxicity in the front office and bad work culture. So, yeah, I mean, my friends, I have plenty of Commanders fans, friends who ever since Josh Harris has come in, they've told me he's been like name checking the Ravens as somebody he wants to emulate. So it would make sense that they would go and hire this guy Blackburn uh, to sort of climb up through the ranks with them. And obviously Peters is uh, going to be really running the show there. But uh it's interesting. I, you know, brain drain with the Ravens is something that happens over the years just because they, you know, they cultivate these homegrown guys. They all seem to be really sharp in the mold of that Eric DaCosta type. So here's another one who's out the door after 17 years or whatever it was. And uh, they're going to have to uh, continue to refill the tanks there as Joe Ortiz has left as well. So, yeah, I mean, if you were to look at like the GM tree of Ozzy DaCosta, or excuse me, of Ozzy Newsome and you know, you can throw Eric DaCosta under that tree, but yeah, they've had so many at this point. And they have what three, three in the NFL right now, Joe D uh, Joe Hortiz. And I feel like I'm missing one. Maybe I'm not, maybe it's just two. right uh, now. Yeah. I mean, Joe, D yeah, you, you named him. Um, yeah. So maybe it's just two, but they, yeah. Scouting wise, front office wise uh, that continues to flourish. And I think that's the number one sign that you're doing things right in your front office. And if you're doing things right in your front office, that usually does trickle down. In sports, maybe not, you know, well, in the core, really in the corporate environment in general. If you're, you know, leadership, your C suite is, you know, reaping what they're sowing and uh, unified and unified in the front down to, you know, your your mid level and lower level employees, then you're probably going to have a well run organization, a well run business, and things of that regard. So I think that is something that the Ravens have maintained, albeit, you know, the little player survey that went out and they all hated, you know, what's Steve Saunders and all that stuff. Uh, I think muddied that a little bit, but I think that was maybe a little hyperbolic and uh, maybe maybe things might have been a little better than they appeared. But the Nate like the Ravens are supposed to have the best of the best. The facility is supposed to be the best. And maybe things weren't, you know, as up to date as the Vikings or the Dolphins who have sick complexes and facilities and things like that. But still, the, the Ravens aim to be classy. They aim to be well run. They aim to have that unified front. And I think that if you're going to steal from organizations, you look to. I mean, I wouldn't say New England anymore. I think, you know, the post-Brady era, no one's looking to poach out of New England anymore. Uh, I would say probably the 49ers, probably the Chiefs at this point, the Eagles, the Steelers still get that, you know, consistency while they haven't had much success lately in the post-Ben Roethlisberger world, and the Ravens. You know, you can maybe throw another couple teams in there, but that's probably the, the Packers are another one. Uh, so I think you look at those organizations as those that are looked at as the class of the NFL. And the Ravens continue to be there. So it's no coincidence that they continue to make the playoffs and have successful teams and sell tickets and do well and all those kinds of things. There you go. And I mean, a lot of this covered in your rant last week too. So a lot of, a lot of ground covered there. A lot of ground. How we, uh, what, how what we comments on that one. I'd some, yeah. There were some comments on that one that were literally is like, what did you listen to three minutes? Like there are comments on that video. It was like, no, they might have listened to my uh, why you're they, might, they might have listened to just my sizzle reel. And I made maybe, it. maybe. Shout out to the sizzler, but uh, they were like, Oh, no, here's why you're wrong. I'm like, Oh my god, you clearly, I, 
went for 15 minutes. It's not that long. The average YouTube viewership on most content is about 22 minutes in long form content. And by 22 minutes, your comments were covered. Whatever your little rebuttals were, they were covered. And then lo and behold, this week we have Todd Munkin. My favorite comment of the week was uh, Todd Munkin saying we need to run the ball better. Did not say we need to run the ball more because that doesn't matter. Volume does not matter. So people up in arms. And so I was, I was enjoying that one a little bit. So uh, I was glad to get that off my chest. I feel good. Yeah, that's good. You uh, you seem to have a little bit more pep in your step this week. There's uh, no talk of high blood pressure and honking tricycles and Bryson Teller and things of that nature. I think we're a little more, uh, maybe the, the, the sinuses have been cleared out a little bit. Yeah, there won't be. I mean, if someone drives down on a victory trike or whatever they're called, Blair and Chris Brown, I mean, I might get a little angry, but we'll see. I saw one of those on 695 the other day. I like those things are just, I, I don't know what's going on. That is just a, a late stage capitalism. Like I, I don't know Th those in cyber trucks are kind of part and parcel to me, which I've been seeing more of lately too. And that needs to stop. I think the cyber truck is sick. Of course you do. That was the most I'm, obvious I'm thing. Not a Tesla guy. I think Tesla's are pieces of crap for the most part. Like they got their dinky, like you can just pull shit out of the, uh, center console it's just all plastic crap but the cyber truck cyber truck looks like it's out of halo like let's be let's be real here that's, that's yeah, i don't want to drive a halo. Halo. i don't want to drive a warthog around you it drive you a know, subaru I, though so you're not going to have a cyber truck it's not for you you're a subaru guy yeah listen they're they're great cars yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be your style i'm not going to have a cyber truck but i think they're cool that's fine people can get them i it's also my right to say i think they're a disgrace and i mean well yes, also i've been right. freedom of speech is here I've seen some uh I've seen some really weird like color jobs on the two people like wrap them in this material. I saw this like one brown one when I was in Los Angeles. I was like, what is going on here? What are we doing? You know what I do think is sick and I really don't know much about, but I do think the Rivians look really cool and I've been seeing a lot more of those lately. Uh, I'm sure hopefully if, if you're a if you're a gearhead, let me know what you think about the Rivian in the in the comments here and rip me apart for that. But I think those look pretty cool and uh, price wise for what I understand their features. I mean, they're, they're definitely more expensive, but those look cool as well. I'm looking at that now. It's kind of got some like postmodernist Bronco vibes to me a little bit. It's like a Bronco and a Hummer and like a Kia combined. That's, that's yeah. how I describe the look Their Their stock is very low. So maybe they're not so hot. 10, 10 bucks a pop right now for, for a little bit of Rivian, uh, holdings, uh, but I don't know in Baltimore, for some reason I've been seeing, I've, Maybe there's a couple that live very close to me. I know there's a yellow one that definitely does, but I feel like I see five of them a week and I don't see them anywhere else. Florida, when I was down in Florida, I actually saw a good bit of them. But yeah, I think they look cool. I'm not sure about the interior and all the logistics and stuff, but Rivian's, Rivian's definitely catch my eye. Very nice. Uh, yeah, okay. So I guess we get a little off track there. But speaking of the Ravens and their personnel, this was an interesting one to me. Tony Jefferson, obviously, was with the Ravens for a number of years. He was with them this past year as a scouting intern. Now going to be coming out of retirement to come back and play some more football. Hopefully he hasn't been signed yet. It was just announced through uh, Jordan Schultz, who I assume talks to him. seems like he talks to a lot of these players, breaks his news that way. Uh, coming back out, uh, big TJ. I know you're a big TJ guy. Always have been. I always remember the play he made against the Steelers, uh, stripping Vance McDonald, and, like the minuscule millimeters of their heels clicked and that prevented that from being a strip six. But that was a sick play. Tony Jefferson, uh, I remember people gave him a lot of shit because he it was like the Jameis Winston got LASIK and was like, oh, I've never been able to see the scoreboard before. Tony Jefferson kind of had one of those. Uh, didn't quite – I'll say he didn't quite live up to the player I thought he would become in Baltimore. He was a solid starter, though. Uh, for whatever reason, just was unable to really stick with tight ends the way he could in Arizona. Tight ends just seemed to kind of dunk on him a little bit more effectively. Uh, but he would be in tight coverage. Him and Chuck Clark both. Chuck, we don't even ever talk about Chuck Clark. Maybe the, one of the weirder careers of any Raven. But uh, I think about those two, and I think about the personality Tony Jefferson had. He was definitely in what I categorize as the the Brandon Williams, Matt Judon, Dancy Dancy years. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, what was that, 20, 2016, 2017-ish through, you know, Lamar's rookie year pretty much. So uh, some weird times, some fun memories. But yeah, if the guy wants to go play some special teams, you know, go try to see if he can make another million bucks. Why not? Have at it. Uh, you know, if you got the itch, go play. And good for him. You know, got a taste of, of front office life. I think he can have a little bit more perspective and probably knows that that's waiting for him still. I would imagine if he had that gateway once, I don't think that closes 
Uh, so yeah, go go itch that go itch that scratch and scratch that itch and see if you can play some ball somewhere. See if maybe you know I don't know the Panthers will pick you up and put you on special teams. Yeah, and he could also he could definitely be one of those coach on the field type guys, kind of what Weddle was at the end of his career. Uh, funny enough, and bring dudes along. He uh, like you said, he's got that great personality, very gregarious, affable, can make fun of himself a little bit. Uh, I think you're right that that was a weird transitional era where Flacco was at the end uh, of his career and they were still kind of trying to go in and uh, spend some money. And he was, I remember that big ticket free agent signing that year where they outbid the, or I guess the Browns outbid them. He signed with the Ravens for less money. And then he, he was kind of going after Browns fans on Twitter, which will always hold a special place in my heart. Uh, so yeah, he was, he was a guy I really, really enjoyed. And uh, you know, it'll be good to see him back. Well, you know, we'll see what happens with this year. I would assume it would be his last one if he does catch on somewhere and then maybe he does, rejoin a, a front office say you know rejoin the ravens and i think it might have been him or it might have been somebody else who like talked about the fact that when you make that transition so quickly you go from like playing and being in the training room in the weight room the practice field the games every single week and then sitting in a desk from like literally 6 a.m until like it's dark outside like that's kind of a tough transition to make sometimes so maybe he's got a little bit more football to get out of his system and then he can uh you know go back to that life that he wants to and if not i'm sure there are other avenues that he can pursue Certainly. And uh, yeah, good for him. Happy to, I mean, I presume that means that he's healthy physically, which is a good thing. You know, if, I think if he was in crippling pain, a guy that did have some pretty big injuries and wouldn't be able to do so. So uh, if he's got a little bit more fight in him, then go see what happens. And I uh, wish him the best. He's a, a fun guy and it's always seemed like a good guy and someone that brought some character to the team and the fans and everything like it. Absolutely. That is all we got for news. Now we can jump and do a little deep dive into what's been going on at OTAs and got a couple sound bites to get through. First one uh, from Rashad Bateman talking a little bit about his contract extension and sort of just the work that he has been putting in ever since getting it in this offseason and hopefully priming himself for what's going to be a big year. I'm blessed for sure. I did not see them doing that, um, but it shows that they believe in me, uh, believe in my work, you know, my ethic, you know, the team believes in me. So um it was a no-brainer. You know, I love playing here. I love this organization. I love the fans. So, you know, I feel like I still got a lot to do. So it was a no-brainer for me, for sure. Uh, I'm not really looking to do anything special, uh, particular. The only thing I can do is control what I can control, and that's, you know, my work ethic uh, every single day. You know, this offseason I've been grinding day in and day out. You know, hopefully that uh, the opportunity comes where I can, like, put that on, on, on tape. Nice to hear. I think it's uh, especially that that first part there. He kind of in the second part, he was just saying all the right things. I'm, you know, it's all about my work ethic, taking things day by day. But I don't know. I like the fact that he opened it by saying, you know, I didn't see them doing that, and maybe that's in reference to the fact that like he really got screwed with that whole fifth year option restricted free agent thing. They showed him a a sign of goodwill, reached across the aisle a little bit, gave him that extension, and the vibes haven't always been great between him and the front office. You know, he's let some frustrations out on Twitter at DaCosta at that you know one juncture and. You know, it, it hasn't always been a smooth ride for him. So it seems like he's kind of at peace right now. And, uh, you know, he's drawing rave reviews from his teammates, too, and some of these other press appearances. So it seems like things are off to a good start for him offseason-wise. I know there's been some consternation from people in the fan base that he's not, like, over here working out with the guys. He's in, you know, California. I know he was in Malibu last week. Uh, I don't know. I think we can kind of – he's here at OTAs. He's, he's grinding away. I think things feel like they're on a, a quiet, sort of reserved, like – good track for him, which is nice this time of year. Hopefully that parlays itself into the summer and he can stay healthy through training camp for the first time. It feels like forever, uh, but uh, all good things from Rashad right now, I think. Yeah. As the world's number one authority on Rashad Bateman, uh, the one, number one thing that stood out to me, I'm going to replay this video real quick, just maybe five seconds of it. I'm blessed for sure. I did not see them doing that, um, but it shows that. The one thing that stands out is the traps, baby. Shoulders yeah. look good. Mm. Traps look good. Wide frame. Number two, you, I'm going to read between the lines and go way too deep into this one. You can tell the look in his eyes, the disposition, his body language, his tone of voice, uh, the cadence at which he's speaking, all of the, some of the verbal cues, but a lot of the nonverbal cues to me appear relaxed and comfortable and confident and healthy and taking it easy. And like, there's no pressure. He has probably felt up against the, the clock in terms of what's going to happen. How am I going to get more money? How am I going to get paid? Who's going to pay me? Am I going to be a free? And he kind of referred to that from what I saw. I didn't listen to everything, uh, you know, ear to the glass, the wall, but it sounded like he was unsure if he was going to be traded. He was unsure if he was going to be a free agent. He was unsure if the Ravens were going to reach out. So 
with the injuries that he had, with maybe the lack of some playing time he thought he maybe should have seen a little bit more of, but really the injuries, that probably brought a lot of stress and pressure to a young man. You know, who knows? This could certainly not be the case. Sometimes guys overreach their pockets when they're a first-round pick a little bit and then have the, the oh shit moment, like, oh shit, I need to make a lot more money. Like I've maybe accrued some debt. He could have been also, I have no idea. I'm just going on a limb here. He could be the most financially savvy person in the world. He could have a hundred million dollars in his bank account. I don't know. But those things weigh on a young man. And I feel like you can see just in this one clip and it is summer and I'm going too far, like I said, but you can just see a different disposition and he looks a little bigger. So I think he's confident. I think he's calm. He also has had a lot more accountability. I think that he looks and sounds, looks body language wise, nonverbal cues, but also looks a lot more like a man than a young man. Uh, I think he sounds like a man. He looks like a man and is past that. You know, his, his brain's about fully developed, I'd say. Rashad Bateman reached that, that 25. He's good to go, you know, ready for some kids maybe. Maybe we see him ready to settle down with a, a nice young lady. So I love it. I love all the things everyone's saying about him. And I love what the Ravens did for him. I love that he's still here. I love his potential. And I, I said on Twitter today, I, one of the clips I said, I'm ready to stamp my, my Mel Kuyper on, you know, Mel Kuyper's Jimmy Clausen of saying, you know, he'll leave the industry. I'm, you know, not hoping it turns out that way. But if Rashad Bateman does not have a setback with his foot or suffer a hamstring, let alone a major injury this year, I think he is going to blow people's minds. I still think it's there. I joke about this with guys like Nate Tice of The Athletic and Jetpack Galileo, guys that are really in the, the wide receiver and skill position scouting department. And it just is there. You can just see the ability and the talent always consistently there. There's always a flash. He rarely went you know, two, three games without showing three, four little flashes that get you super excited. So if he's healthy with the way he looks, with the way he sounds, and with considering what he's gone through and maybe having some of that Ah, ability to breathe out for the first time. I think he's got the stars aligned to, you know, I'm not going to say he's going to have 1,200 yards, but be a mismatch weapon problem. And I think Todd Munkin's probably very excited at the prospect of kind of relying on him a little bit more in that Odell Beckham role uh, than, than maybe Odell Beckham, who really you had to have the training wheels on with. Not really the training wheels, but had to have like the, the emergency break or like the, the okay, we can't overwork him or you don't, don't want to do too much or, all those kinds of things. So super excited for Rashad, happy for him, and can't wait to see what he does this year. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, sentiment that last year was this like massively down season for him, and it definitely wasn't great. And for a first-round pick, he won a lot more uh, production-wise. But A, that's just not going to happen with wide receivers in the Ravens' offense as long as Lamar Jackson is here. It's just always going to be a different type of play style. Uh, not that that's bad necessarily. I think some people look at volumetric stats for wide receivers as the end all be all. I don't think we're those people at all. And I think the Ravens are better for it. Just kind of doing what they're going to do and B, I mean, when you talk about that season, going back to it, you remember that Jonas Schaefer supercut of like all the times Bateman was open downfield and Lamar just didn't go to him for whatever reason. Maybe some of that's overblown, but you know, there's probably something there as well, where a little bit more time with those guys together, more time for him to mesh in the offense, more time for him to have a real role where he's not kind of just Beckham, you know, Beckham Jr., Jr., Beckham Jr., Jr., right? They're going to get him in there uh, a lot more often, kind of like they did at the end of last season when <laughs> Beckham was sort of low-key benched for him at times, and they were really trying to work him in and uh, try to take advantage of the juice and the athleticism that he probably has a little bit more of at this point. So, yeah, it's all very, uh, all good things, all very exciting, and I'm excited for you for this breakout. And hopefully, you won't have to leave the media space. And the good thing about that is you won't have to either way because Mel... Definitely with there on Jimmy Clausen, and he is still thankfully on the airways with us. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere, but I'm willing to fake go there. Okay, good. Uh, up next, we've got uh, Greg Lewis, wide receivers coach on Little Tez Walker. He's a sponge. Uh, he wants to know everything, uh, and, and he's doing a great job with that. You see his length and his speed out there on the field um, and making big body catches, contested catches, but then he could take the top off coverages. Um, and he, he's doing a great job as far as the offense is concerned. Learning and understanding what we're trying to do is different from what he did in college, and it's a lot of nuances, and he's picking, he's picking them up seamlessly. So I'm excited where he's at now and where he can go in the future. So not a tongue you can really take from that kind of stuff as they're probably going to – Praise a guy, but I thought this was pretty effusive praise by Greg Lewis into Tez Walker. And it's something that I think you want to see when it comes to a young guy. You want to hear that 
they're doing all the right things on the preparation level where they're asking a ton of questions. They're active in the meetings, you know, and it's like some people mistake like not asking questions or not sort of being involved like that as a young person as like laziness or whatever. Sometimes it just comes down to intimidation. Like you don't even want to ask questions because you don't want to look stupid. It sounds like if he's uh, already willing to do that kind of stuff, he's over that mental hurdle and he's ready to just kind of get to work. So uh, a pick that I think we both really liked a lot. We're very excited about it. seems like he's off to a good start here too. He's the, we're, we're willing to say that he's the, the Jakey bubble breaker. He's the fourth round pick that should have been a third round pick. Breaker or, of uh, bubbles. The breaker of bubbles, destroyer of chains, uh, the the fourth round receiver that maybe makes an impact here. So, yeah, uh, love to hear it. Again, the kid clearly, I don't know him, but when you read his story, he clearly loves football very, very, very much to just float around, rehab by working at Bojangles, go to Liberty, go to freaking, or excuse me, go to Kent State and go to North Carolina and commit to all these schools and just do whatever it could do whatever he could to play some damn football. So that combined with, Oh, by the way, he's an elite, elite, elite world-class athlete in terms of speed, in terms of body control, in terms of the ability to take the top off. And again, uh, I think we've talked about Tory Smith. Of course, we're always going to make, you know, purple tinted player comparisons where there's probably someone more appropriate to compare him to, but Tory Smith loved the pick talked about it when he was picked and kind of reminds you of Torrey Smith there, you know, maybe not the greatest hand technique catching the football, but bigger than he appears faster than it's like, you know, he's fast and he's still faster than that. And, you know, I feel like Torrey Smith was really quote unquote raw coming into the league, but the ability to track the football and run faster and run through guys and use his body position, body position along the sideline, Allowed Tory to make a really big impact before he kind of rounded into a more, you know, starting caliber, consistent impact player. And you see a lot of those similarities with Tez Walker in terms of size, speed, traits, qualities, all those kinds of things. And I think that he does have a lot of potential to at least stretch the field and make five, seven, ten really impactful plays for the Ravens this year. Yeah. And it's nice. I mean, like if speaking of the bubble, like if this guy hits and then they've got Bateman under contract for another three years, I mean, with the contract that Nico Collins signed today, which I think is going to be a good deal ultimately for the Texans, but I mean, three years, 72 million that nets out to what, 24 a year. I mean, these guys, if they're both cheap and they're both good for the next three years, that's going to be a boon for the Ravens because Zay Flowers is also young and cheap. So that's, it's, it's all exciting stuff, but yeah, that wide receiver bubble, very much a real thing. Hopefully he is the breaker of bubbles to your point there. Hopefully. Last, we've got Mark Andrews talking about year two under your guy, Todd Funkhauser Munkin. Um, yeah, it's been fun, you know, just coming back and um, and seeing just the, the the little nuances and the direction of, of what we're trying to do, um, change up, um, keep defenses honest. Um, I think we have some really cool and dangerous things that um, he's implementing. Um, it's very much, um, you know, we're going to see the offer, we're going to see the defense make a good call and um, and make it right. And that's that's what you want to be able to do is, is get into the right call and um, and have your guys fly around. So we got a lot of great players, great receivers, great tight ends, and um, quarterback is is second to none. So and so. Yeah, so uh, another one that you can't really glean a ton from, but I do know you have some thoughts on how they can expand this offense under Munkin in year two of the Munkin experience. I think that last year was a year of what everyone else thought they should do. And it worked in a, in ways. Okay. They need to use more 11. Okay. They need to implement some more zone running stuff. Okay. You want to go under center more and going under center worked very well and was a great addition, especially in the past game. I feel like they did that. A lot of those things as a result, maybe of outside noise, and now they kind of, maybe they did, you know, put that shot in their bag. But now they don't need to use it. You know, they don't need to put, you know, they got the hybrid in the bag now. They don't need to use it, though. They have it. They can be confident in their own skin, play within their own game. They forced growth for the sake of growth. And now can go back into the realm of being more multiple and dominating in the areas of the field they like to, running the football the way that they want to. And, I mean, Jesus Christ, man. The running back room has been a shit show for basically since Mark Ingram left. I mean, yeah. since Mark Ingram was a Raven, the running back room has been a shit show. Since J.K. Dobbins in, what, 2020 had that really strong finish to the year, uh, lo and behold, you know, even in the playoffs, in, in that Bills game, they had some some weird moments there. But 
you know, it's been no disrespect to Gus Edwards, love him to death. No disrespect to J.K. Dobbins, went through some, you know, crazy stuff, showed some flashes. Think of that Bengals game, you know, on the road in the playoffs where he clearly still isn't healthy, you know, working his tail off. But got Derrick Henry back there now. They're going to run the football. They're going to play big boy ball. They're going to create mismatches. They do have Lamar Jackson at quarterback still. They do have really good tight ends and, uh, you know, a, a U back, whatever you want to call him, and Pat Ricard. So they're going to go back to playing Baltimore Ravens football, but they already grew enough to, I don't know, it just feels like they they did the things to get rid of their deficiencies so that, you know, I don't know, for another useless euphemism, you know, they, they're not struggling versus the breaking ball. Like they can hit the breaking ball now. There's not some sort of adjustment that you can make against them to make them one-dimensional and ineffective. Uh, and to me, that feels, you know, like the Bills needed to run the ball effectively. And I think those two teams, the Bills and Ravens, have kind of seen the parallel of each other. The Bills needed a more balanced attack. The Ravens needed a more balanced attack. It was different sides of the seesaw. So they've gone towards that. So I think that that's how you have to be able to go win the AFC and, you know, maybe be, you know, if you're the Bills or the Ravens, be the first team that uh, can win a Super Bowl out of the AFC, not, you know, with a quarterback named Brady or Mahomes in what, the last decade? Has anybody? Are they the only two in the last decade? I think so, yeah. yeah. Peyton Manning, the, I guess. Uh, Burrow was the the one shot that you had there, and it didn't didn't go there. The Broncos nice. were in 2015. Yeah, that was 2015, and then 16 I mean, was Pats again. 17 Pats again. 18. And the Broncos. I mean, their defense won. The Peyton Manning couldn't even throw the damn ball. But Look, yeah. I mean, a tremendous shout out to Ravens legend Owen Daniels for his contributions in that Super Bowl. I think uh, he scored oh, yeah. in that, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So yeah, I'm excited for it. I think they're going to be comfortable in their own skin, but have every answer and took maybe I'll say one year too long, you know, probably should have moved on from Greg Roman one year prior. Uh, they probably had the injury excuse because that 2021 season, they're like, Oh, well it wasn't, you know, we'll just try and see if we can get these guys back and make some additions and go on and go forth. But the, the injuries kind of laid over there in some ways and feels like they're away from that now new offense, but also an old offense. I mean, like I said, I think last week, Sam Schwartz team was mess, had to message me and be like, watching the Ravens for Thursday Night Football, what's the difference between this and Roman's offense? It's like, there's a lot of similar stuff in there still. Uh, but, you know, it's all more mature. Lamar Jackson should be able to direct traffic more. And I don't know, man. Like, he, they talked a lot, of, a lot about Isaiah Likely. Can't leave that guy on the bench. He is super talented. He was dominant. He wasn't just an impact player. He was like a star player for them. Down the stretch, I mean, this is a stupid way to put it, but if you play DFS, he was not, you know, 3500 bucks anymore some weeks. He was up 48, you know, he's a top 10 tight end in terms of money there because he was playing that kind of football and can't leave that on the bench. He's got to be playing at least, you know, two out of three, six out of 10 snaps. You don't want that guy on the bench. He's fucking good at football and has to be on the field. So I'm excited to see this. Offense that uses Henry, Andrews, Likely, Flowers, Bateman, Aguilar, Ricard as the core group. You know, throw throw a Tez Walker in there a little bit. Uh, you know, a little bit of Charlie Kohler in there. Those are that that's your offense. And I think that's a fun, versatile, explosive, dangerous group. Yeah, there's no like and I, I like that receiver, you know, they didn't go crazy this offseason, but there was a little bit of investment with bringing Aguilar back. You've got Bateman now signed back again. It feels like the vibes are good there. And then you drafted Walker. So this isn't going to be like a 2022, you know, it's week 12 and we're throwing Prochet out there against the Broncos and re-signing Sammy Watkins after he gets cut by the Packers. Like this is a little bit more of a serious operation as far as receiver goes. So if they want to go back to, you know, a little bit more ground and pound smash mouth type stuff that you're talking about, I think they're well suited for it. You get Jackson under center a little bit more. You uh, start to you know, as he ages, help him age gracefully a little bit and uh, get Henry, Henry the ball in his hands while he's already running. I think that's uh, all very exciting stuff, and they still have the talent to back it up at receiver a little bit. It's not as much of a splash, obviously, as it was with Beckham, but I think they're competent there, and you've got likely in the mix to your point, uh, who also spoke to the media today, had some good things to say. Probably should have cut something from him, actually. Love, love to hear from Isaiah Likely, the other Zay in this offense, as John Harbaugh refers to him. Uh, but uh, overall, any more thoughts before we get out of here, my friend? I agree with all that, but I will say, speaking of Zay, a lot rides on him being healthy. Yeah. A lot. A lot, a lot, a lot rides on him being healthy. And uh, the the dynamic athleticism and mismatch problems in terms of deceleration on routes that he presents, you know, Bateman can do a little bit of that. 
you know, Bateman, you want Bateman healthy too, you know, but it feels like if Bateman goes down, then Aguilar steps up and, you know, those are not terribly dissimilar skill sets in some ways. Uh, but I, Zay Flowers to me is the one guy, especially out of the skill position players that you are really depending on to play at least 15 games and have healthy in the playoffs. So, uh, you know, he, he looks like one of those freaks that is just kind of like in that Tyreek Hill mold where he's just bendy and flexy and, explosive and you know almost feels like he's you know cut from another cloth in terms of athleticism so hopefully he is able to be that little piece of iron that he's been and stay healthy and uh, uh that's the one way i think that's a way to you know kind of take this offense from maybe being a championship offense to a good offense instead is to remove zay flowers from it so maybe they gotta yeah. do is uh just go sign my guy hunter renfro a little slot machine action Sure, sure, sure. Bring him in. Bring in the the Renfrenator. Get your little your little Lad McConkey Junior. Senior. That's what I'm saying. That's that's what I'm talking about. They didn't get Lad, who I'm sure I'm sure Todd Monken was standing up on the table or pounding the table. One of the two. I think standing up on the table is a little more effusive. If you're pounding the table, that's uh that's a little bit you know that's that's an endorsement, but it's not standing up on the table. He was probably in between release patterns there on the table talking about Lad McConkey. They didn't get him. So go and get the other, the other receiver. Hunter. There's a big, there's a big movement on Twitter of like, Lad McConkey is not Hunter Renfro. He plays on the outside. He is faster than that. It's like, all right, all right, we get it, we get it. Yeah. No, there's a, you know, well, <laughs> there's a lot to that. You, you, you've been talking about the brain worms lately. We, that's an avenue that we don't need to go down. Speaking of which, I mean, I don't know if we've talked about RFK Junior's brain worms on here. RFK the literal Jr. real brain worms. That he had. Oh, I forgot about his. Yeah, I forgot about the brain worms. I don't remember what it. I just remember he was ranting and raving about brain worms in some capacity. Sixty percent of people have brain worms or some weird, weird shit. It's not that weird. Sixty <laughs> percent. <laughs> what was oh, he saying? I don't know. I didn't actually. I to be fair, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't looked up the full thing. I just saw a bunch of tweets about how yeah he actually had real brain worms, and I was like, there's no fucking yeah, way. Yeah, he said real. he did. Yeah, no, yeah. that's some re- that. Aaron Rodgers is probably like, oh, we all have brain worms. I mean, <laughs> glad he's bringing this topic to light. Yeah, the mainstream media, <laughs> the lamestream media doesn't want to talk about your brain worms. So that's us talking about it. We're we're better than the lamestream media. RFK Jr. New York Times. RFK Jr. says doctors found a dead worm in his brain. There you go. <laughs> oh, uh, I thought you'd be tickled by that. I was, uh, you might have. I'm pretty sure you can get parasites up there. I did. I was told that picking your nose uh, leads to Alzheimer's. In which case, I am not going to know where I am a long time from now. Okay. Well, that, that that is our public service announcement for this week. Do not pick your nose. Do not do it. All right. Is that all we got? I think that's all we got, my friend. Orioles are cool. Things are getting off the rails quickly in this Orioles game. Mm, I have not turned it on yet, so I'm going to go do that right now. Thank you all, as always, for listening. Uh, if you liked what you heard, go ahead and hit us with that subscribe on the YouTube page. Like our videos, comment on them to get the algorithm going. Follow us on social media at Exit52Podcast across Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, where we're posting about all our content and other stuff as well. I am at Jake Luke on Twitter. That is L O U Q U E. Spencer is at Ravens for Dummies. That is the number four in the middle there. Thanks, as always, to all our presenting sponsors in Jimmy's Famous Seafood, Fed Thrill Sunglasses, and, of course, Black Eyed Susan Spices, who brought you today's episode. Appreciate you guys all very much, and we will talk to you again very, very soon. See ya. Arrivederci. And they execute the system, and that's what it's all about. Oh, God. Yes, sir. Trust. Big trust. Big, big trust. trust. Big big trust, trust. Hey, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> right on cue. Hey, right on cue. Hey, I, let me go.